Good morning, my name is Bill and I'm an alcoholic. And today's show is called There Seems to Be a Pattern. Growing up in a time of change and growing up in the time that was busy and where our lives were full of hope and enthusiasm were pretty much how we enjoyed the years in the early 60s. We'd just arrived from London and my granny bought us a house in the West Country. It was a lovely house and we lived in a lovely road. There was lots of children to play with. And for all intents and purposes, we kind of didn't want for anything. I certainly didn't. Life in the early 60s was easy going. There was no sensational advertising. There was no trends where you wore what you were given and you ate what was put in front of you. Our food intake was pretty basic. I think the only tins we had in the house were tins of baked beans. Maybe we had a tin of peaches. I can't really remember. But we were happy with our lot. And I know the people next door obviously had more money than us. Because they had a car. And whilst my toys were often old and broken and scratched, the little boy next door, about my age, he had toys that were new. But, you know, there wasn't any sensational advertising then. There wasn't any void between us and the next-door neighbours. We just all got on. There was no look at them and what they've got and we haven't got it. Just didn't come into it. Tupperware was the next big thing in the 1960s. And Tupperware was probably one of the first consumables that I ever remember. And Tupperware was some new plates and cups and saucers that my granny bought us. And they were new and different because they were unbreakable and all our plates and cups and glasses were made out of glass or china. And if you drop them, they broke. Well, there were the, here were these new plates that were unbreakable. And my brother, just to, to prove a point, threw one of the plates down the front garden path and it bounced a few times on the concrete and it didn't break. I was mesmerised. And it was the first time in my life that I'd seen something new come through that we've grown used to today with new and different things being launched onto the market, but there was certainly nothing very new in our day. Where if you had a fridge, that would last you a lifetime, so did a cooker. We also had the Tizer lorry, and for those who don't know, I don't know whether it's specific to our city, but we had a factory called the Tizer factory, and they made Tizer, and Tizer was the very first carbonated drink that I ever drank. It was the first fizzy lemonade as such. And the Tizer lorry would come round maybe every week, two weeks, I can't remember. And people would go out and buy a bottle of Tizer. You certainly didn't buy it from the shop. But we never had Tizer in the house because it was a luxury. And we lived off the very basics because we had no money. But it didn't matter. I'd obviously tasted Tizer at some point. The red cherry tasting, cherry aid type of Tizer. Or maybe strawberry. But on the back of the lorry were all the different colour Tizers you can get. And I suppose going next door to the little boy's house where his dad had a car and I'd have tea. And that's probably where I tasted Tizer. And it was lovely. It was fizzy. It was sweet. Mm, I can remember it to this day. And the other thing we bought was tea, obviously, but tea was still loose and you bought it in little cardboard boxes and inside of each box was a little tea card. And these little tea cards were pictures of maybe aeroplanes or bird's eggs or trees or African animals or footballers, 
Hollywood stars, cars, flowers, leaves, anything really. And the idea was that you collected the sets and we had little books to stick the sets in. So one book would be for the set of footballers, another book would be for a set of trees or aeroplanes and the idea was to find the whole set and I do believe there may be 50 or 100 in the set, I can't really remember but I was an avid collector, I was one of those little boys that loved collecting and we would glue all of these cards into the books and the glue was always made out of flour and water, that's what we had I don't even remember having any sellotape the milkman used to come round every day, summer or winter, rain or shine, snow or sleet or ice, he would be there. To be a milkman was a job that you kept for life, and to turn up every day was close to godliness. Their focus on delivering a, surface, delivering a service to us was second to none. And they would often start out at four or five in the morning, delivering milk to our doorstep. And that poor milkman, on the cold, wet, snowy, icy days, he'd have his hat on and his big coat. And he'd have gloves with all the fingers cut out so he could put three bottles of milk in between his fingers on each hand. And he was always walking really, really quickly. And on the really snowy or icy days, we'd get out there early and help push the milk float around. And it was an electric milk float where the milkman used to walk in front. And in front was a long handle that when he held the handle and pushed it down and pushed the little white button in the front, the cart would go along at walking pace. And that's how we had our milk delivered. And as a bit of a sideline, he would sell eggs and maybe some potatoes. And he'd sell yoghurt. Now, yoghurt was something that I'd never seen before. It was something certainly very new. I don't think you could buy it in the shops. And the yoghurt came in only two flavours. It was plain yoghurt or strawberry yoghurt came in little glass jars and had a little tin lid on and you know like the Tizer I probably tasted it next door at my friend's house whose dad had a car and it was really sour but I loved it we never had much in our house we only lived on the very basics we had bread and cheese and milk and eggs, maybe a tin of beans. I think we may have had um, some tinned fruit, maybe tinned prunes, I can't really remember. But even where chicken was a luxury in our day, and we probably lived on breast of lamb because that was the cheapest meat we could buy. But, you know, in those early days, when I was a little kid, I started to notice patterns of behaviour that ended up being quite prominent in my life. But it's only as the years went on that I would see that I could get very upset and angry and resentful at what people had done. But I wouldn't deal with it or talk to anybody. I stored it up. And then often one day it would all come out sideways and I would shout and get people upset. And I would upset myself. And that carried, into, carried on into my drinking. And one of the first patterns I saw in my drinking, that as I drank more and more, <clears throat> as I got into more and more trouble or got resentful or angry and lost friends, I would start to change my drinks. And I went from whiskey to gin to beer, to sherry, to wine, thinking, well, if I change my drinks, then these bad episodes in my life may not 
reoccur, but actually they made no difference. And I would go from whiskey to beer, maybe thinking, well, <clears throat> you know, I won't get so drunk, but while I was on the beer or the sherry, I just drank more. And the trouble was, I didn't know and nobody else knew exactly how I would be on any given day. I could be happy or sad. I could be resentful, fearful. I could be angry or laid back. I didn't know and nobody else knew. And when one of these episodes would come along and I would just completely lose the plot and shout at people, it frightened them and it frightened me. And I would go away angry and mortified at what I'd said. But it was almost like someone had switched a switch and everything from the previous few months came out in a torrent. And then I'd feel good again. And I think someone explained to me years ago, it was like someone snuck up behind me in the middle of the night and put a, put a coiled spring in my gut. And I didn't know when it would go off, but it always did. Another pattern of my behaviour was that I always envied people who had an all or nothing personality. I always envied people of extremes and consequently I would copy them because I suppose I thought, well, if I envied them, if I became like them, then people would envy me. In recovery, in the 12-step recovery program, we very much look for patterns of behaviour and of reoccurring situations. For that is alcoholism. Me repeatedly picking up a drink is a pattern. It's a re reoccurring situation. Because the insanity we talk about in our steps doesn't mean to say I'm mad or I'm stupid. It means the insanity of doing something over and over again and never learning from my past mistakes or the consequences. Reoccurring things in my life, in my alcoholism, should have been a warning sign. Because there's a good old saying in AA, if bad things keep happening, stop doing them. But I just never saw that until I was, what, many years sober. But the patterns in sobriety, the patterns of behaviour, is where we go over and over and over the same things, never learning for them and repeating them for decades. And quite frankly, I ended up doing some intensely insane things. Probably more when I was drunk than when I was sober. But things that when I look back at could have cost me my life many times over. And when I look back at really still quite frightened me. Other patterns of behaviour were people pleasing. Worrying about everything that ever happened. I never drove at the speed limit. I was always losing friends. I was moving the pubs I drank in. And there was certainly a pattern in everything I did. And that pattern was a pattern of negativity, of remorse, of resentment, of loss. Many years later, in recovery, I was probably three or four years sober, I took up hill walking. We'd always done a lot of walking, but I took it up again and with me and my wife and we bought all the gear. But hill walking was to be another pattern of behaviour where Everything was done at breakneck speed. Everywhere had to be got to as fast as humanly possible. And like my garden, I either kept my garden beautifully manicured, with no weeds, 
no snails. It was all brushed and all the edges were tidy. Or I just didn't bother at all. Another pattern of behaviour that was just as prominent in my drinking as it was in my sobriety was something I carried over into AA where I made sure I did my meetings regularly. I made sure I kept called my sponsor regularly. I started helping others. And I was told to go to any lengths for victory over alcoholism, and that's certainly something I did. So far from these patterns of behaviour being consigned to the dustbin of my past, my all or nothingness, my getting things right, being somewhere on time, I transferred into my recovery, thank God. Because recovery is a continuing process of change, where submissions and letting go is, is an everyday part of staying sober. Because sobriety is an ongoing series of surrender. And each new little act we have in, in our recoveries, maybe picking up a worm or helping someone out or opening a door, each one of these is but a spiritual experience. Repetitiveness and stick to itiveness are as important today as, as sitting back and doing absolutely nothing. I drank every day, I got drunk every day, and I lived with the consequences of my drinking every day. And so, in recovery, where if I repeat what I did in my drinking, I'm replacing one pattern of behaviour for another. And if I put that effort and enthusiasm and time and focus into my recovery that I had in my drinking, I'm transferring the patterns of behaviour that come very naturally to me. And that, my friends, is how I've stayed sober. By doing today what I did yesterday. And just like I did in my drinking, it is no different to what I'm doing in sobriety. I just copied what I did the day before. So nothing is really different today in sobriety as it was in my drinking, except that one caused upset and disharmony and anger and low self-worth and loss and tears, and the other one brings hope and harmony and willingness and brings a certain love and tolerance into this world. So that's my little share on patterns of behaviour. And I will say that who says what you can't have one without the other? Because if I hadn't been that all or nothing person and I hadn't been prone to patterns of behaviour that I did, all I've done is transferred everything into recovery where AA has taken the place very neatly and the meetings and calling my sponsor has taken the place very neatly of doing it every day where I used to pick up a drink every day. Build the shirt, Bristol. <laughs>